Good morning, everyone, and you're warmly welcome to St. Colin Ballas Valley Home on the 17th of May 2020 and our morning service for the sixth Sunday of Easter. I was mentioning last week Christian Aid Week and how it has not been postponed this year. They're going ahead, and the hope is that people will respond online. I just brought this little page from the magazine by way of reminder, helping the world's poorest through the coronavirus crisis, you can still give, and in fact, I hope some of you will still give. And as I said last Sunday, how wonderful it would be if the £400,000 Northern Ireland Christian Aid total could be topped this year, uh, even without the red envelopes. But for now, we begin with our greeting, and I want to greet all of you today, uh, whether you're uh, parishioners or joining us simply online. Perhaps you've happened accidentally upon our YouTube service today. Good to have you all here. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Together we pray. Lord Jesus, our risen Savior, we rejoice in your mighty victory over sin and death. You are the Prince of Life. You are alive forevermore. Help us to know your presence, not only as we worship you now, but in our families, as we work, and in everything we do. For your great name's sake. Amen. And as ever, as we come to the Lord in praise and prayer, first of all, we confess our sins and say sorry together to him. Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Let us therefore rejoice by putting away all malice and evil and confessing our sins with a sincere and true heart. And that's 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Together we pray. Jesus Christ, risen Master and triumphant Lord, we come to you in sorrow for our sins and confess to you now our weakness and unbelief. We have lived by our own strength and not by the power of your resurrection. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived by the light of our own eyes as faithless and not believing. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. We have lived for this alone and doubted our home in heaven. In your mercy, forgive us. Lord, hear us and help us. May the God of love and power forgive us and free us from our sins heal and strengthen us by his Spirit, and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Today's psalm is Psalm 66 and verses 7 to 18, and we'll say it by alternate verse. Bless our God, O you peoples. Make the voice of his praise to be heard, who holds our souls in life and suffers not our feet to slip. For you, O God, have proved us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare. You laid heavy burdens upon our backs. You let enemies ride over our heads. We went through fire and water, but you brought us out into a place of liberty. I will come into your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer you fat burnt sacrifices with the smoke of rams. I will sacrifice oxen and goats. Come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I called out to him with my mouth, and his praise was on my tongue. If I had nursed evil in my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But in truth, God has heard me. 
He has heeded the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not rejected my prayer, nor withheld his loving mercy from me. And we continue with the collect for the sixth Sunday of Easter. Let us pray. God, our Redeemer, you have delivered us from the power of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of your Son. Grant that as by his death he has recalled us to life, so by his continual presence in us he may raise us to eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Glad to have Denise Wilson preaching today, our Dawson reader, and I think at this point we'll hear from one of the other Wilsons, Rory or Gideon, with our Bible reading. Reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walk around and look carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in a temple built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needs anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any of us for in him we live and move and have our being as some of your own poets have said we are his offspring therefore since we are god's offspring we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has sent a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, open our eyes that we may see wonderful things from your law. Amen. On one of our family adventures, we stayed in an Airbnb cottage. It was perfect for our needs but it soon became very clear on arrival that the owners were very religious. There were multiple religious pictures in every room. In cupboards, we kept finding religious relics and plastic figurines. It obviously didn't spoil our holiday, but it was rather overwhelming. Apparently, Athens contained many gods and images of gods, more than the rest of Greece put together. So when Paul says in verse 22, I know you're very religious. He was stating a fact. He wasn't just trying to butter them up. Athens was a decadent religious hub of the Greco-Roman world, a city of philosophers and intellectuals. It appears to be a city which had room for everyone's God. They even had a plaque to the unknown God, just in case they left one out and caused offense. The word idolatry seems old fashioned, irrelevant even and conjures up images of people worshipping the golden calf, hot off the coals, fashioned from their own melted trinkets. The very idea of worshipping a god made by human hands seems ridiculous. 
In our developed world, it is easy to put the Athenians' behaviour down to ignorance because we have learned so much since then. We can give, forgive them such foolishness, all the while believing ourselves to be above such behaviour. But are we? How many of us are guilty of idolising ourselves, another person or thing, with such love, adoration and even reverence that we put them or ourselves before God? And I know I am guilty of doing that. Modern day examples of gods might include any number of screen activities, our phones, iPads, tablets, computers, careers, sports, celebrities, social media, food, academia, having the perfect body image, money, and alcohol. Idolatry is not confined to the secular world either. Ministry in itself can become an idol when the focus is on the program or pleasing people, so much so that that actually becomes more important than pleasing God. And we can become so consumed with the task God has given us that we completely forget about nurturing our relationship with him. How much time and effort do we give these things in comparison to the amount of time we spend with God getting to know him? I can easily spend two hours watching a movie, but to give those two hours to God would sadly be a stretch. Eugene Peterson observes, life's basic decision is rarely, if ever, whether to believe in God or not, but whether to worship or compete with him. Just let me repeat that last line again, but whether to worship or compete with him. None of the earlier examples I gave are inherently bad, but when our desire for those things becomes paramount, when our lifestyle, our morals and habits are formed and directed by our love for these things, we are in effect worshipping them. We are owned and enslaved by them. Now, you might ask, well, what's the harm? I want to illustrate this by going back to uh, the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Some of you might have to think back a bit further than others. But remember how Little Red Riding Hood approached the bed where the wolf was dressed in the grandmother's nightie, her nightcap and her glasses. And while Red Riding Hood had a vague sense of unease, she was curious and stra strangely fascinated. And she moved slowly toward the bed all the time making observations. Oh, what big ears you have, Grandma. Oh, what big eyes you have, Grandma. And finally, oh, what big teeth you have, Grandma. The reader can clearly see past the wolf's disguise and knows that it's not going to end well. The wolf is devious. He always had an answer for her right up to the point when he was going to attack. Tom Wright suggests that when human beings worship that which is not God, they give authority to forces of destruction and malevolence, and those forces gain power. Idolatry can gobble us up, just like the wolf in Little Red Riding Hood. What begins as curiosity and casual interest can become a consuming force. The psalmist tells us in Psalm 115, verses 4 to 8, but their idols are silver and gold made by human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak, eyes but cannot see. They have ears but cannot hear, noses but cannot smell. They have hands but cannot feel, feet but cannot walk, nor can they utter a sound with their throats. Those who make them will be like them, and so will all who trust in them. The writer of Kings agrees, they followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. Idolatry makes us dull, blind, and deaf. It deadens our spirit and personality, resulting in feelings of worthlessness. We may have been looking for comfort or a boost to our self-esteem, or even an escape but the fix is only temporary, leading to disappointment and yet more emptiness. Our pursuit of some of these things can also hurt those we love most, 
leading to broken relationships, debt, and poor mental health. If humans had a manufacturing label attached, it would say, handmade by God, treat with care. You see, we were designed and created by our Father God, created to worship Him alone, to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. The reality is, though, that we are like little children, easily distracted by colorful, noisy toys, our interest and attention span is fickle. But God knew that this would be our biggest struggle, to worship Him alone, and we can see that in the commandments that He gave us. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or bow down to it. That's why he told the Israelites in Deuteronomy to write his words on their minds and hearts, to tie them as symbols on their doorposts, on their gates, to teach their children about him, to talk about him on the road together. He knew that we would be easily distracted and prioritize other people and things above him. Jesus knew that we, the church, could never follow him without supernatural help. And therefore, he left us his helper, the Holy Spirit. He would remind us of God's word, prick our consciences when we would choose a path that would lead to sin or simply not be God's best for us. And ultimately, he would be our true comforter. One of the things that I really love, and I think I will enjoy even more after this lockdown, is going to the Opera House be it a pantomime, a play, or a musical. I absolutely love it. And often I may know the storyline, but I, as I sit and look at the red curtain waiting for the performance to start, there is an air of mystery as to how the company will present the show. Then the orchestra begins and the curtain swishes back and boom, I'm drawn in. Paul does something similar here in Athens as he addresses the Areopagus which is basically a place where philosophers met to debate. Paul introduces the living God to the people who worshipped images. He says, my God may be invisible, but he created heaven and earth. He wasn't made by human hands. In fact, his hands made you and all the nations of the world. He is the one who determined where and when each person should live. To the rationalists, Paul pointed to Jesus as the logical choice and the true reason behind all things. God is invisible, yet close to each one who seeks him. In fact, this God entered into the mess and the brokenness of humankind visibly in Jesus, dying on the cross, raised to life again so that we might enjoy an intimate and living relationship with him. So will we choose this day who we will serve? In Chiwoko, a hospital, um, one of the pieces, the vital pieces of equipment was uh, oxygen concentrators and the church may even have contributed money actually to buy a few of these for the hospital. But basically their purpose is to deliver a high percentage of oxygen to those with breathing difficulties. And it wasn't until a medical technician came to work at Chiwoko and began to run quality assurance tests on the equipment that it was discovered the concentrators were not working properly. And in actual fact, instead of benefiting the patients, they were actually doing the patients damage. So the concentrators were recalibrated and began to perform properly and subsequently help save many lives. This time in lockdown invites us to recalibrate according to our maker's instructions so that we can live a life of abundance and fruitfulness. We've been given an opportunity like no other generation to press the reset button, to recalibrate, to honestly consider what is truly important in life and where our values and where our priorities lie. Paul says that ignorance is no longer an excuse. The truth has been revealed. Jesus is alive. Therefore, we need to repent. And this means simply that we say sorry to God for not putting him first and that we turn away from 
our idolatrous practices and worship the one true and living God. One morning over breakfast, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me more than these? And really that's the rub this morning, that's the challenge to you and to me. Denise, do you love me more than everything and everyone else in your life? And I would love to tell you this morning that the answer to that question is yes, but God knows the truth. He knows my heart. And the truth is my desire for God fluctuates and I get caught up in other things. At some point, I realize that I've left God behind somewhere and I return to my heavenly father, apologize and start walking with him again. And I thank God for his patience and his persistence with me. Where is God on your priority list this morning? Does it matter to you if he is even on that list? Do you love him more than anything else? And what needs to change in your life so that you worship God alone? Jesus asks you this morning, do you love me more than these? Amen. And our affirmation of faith. Why not stand with me if you can? Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who have not seen him and yet have believed. He is our Lord and our God. We have seen his glory, the glory which he had as the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The Lord says to us, do you love me? Our hearts reply, you know that we love you. Jesus says, whoever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him shall never die. Yes, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We turn to the Lord in prayer for our intercessions and thanksgivings. Again, back to Rory or to Gideon. Let us pray. And now it's time for our intercessions. The response to the, the prayer, in your mercy, Lord, is make us true to Christ. Father Almighty, you reign over everything in heaven and earth. You reign victoriously over every principality and power. One day every tribe and nation will bow before you. Forgive us when we think that we know better than you and go our own way. Help us humbly follow your leading, obey your commands and prompts, and to do so with a cheerful and a willing heart. In your mercy, Lord, make us true to Christ. Father, stir in us a desire to know and worship you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us, so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth. Help us to practice an attitude of gratitude for all the good gifts that you have given to us. In your mercy, Lord, Make us true to Christ. Almighty Father, we continue to ask that you rescue us from the coronavirus. We pray for our family and friends, that you would keep us safe, and that should any of us get it, that none would be severely unwell. We lift before you the members of our congregation at special risk due to their age or underlying health conditions. Father, we ask not only that you would keep them safe, but also that you would encourage them in their isolation, knowing that they're in our prayers and our love, and that you would be especially close to them at this difficult time. We pray for the nursing homes in our area, for the staff and residents. 
We ask you would keep them safe, Lord. We ask you would keep the staff strong. Lord, we ask you would keep all of them, Lord, uh, safe from this disease. We look to you to guide our government, our scientists, and medical experts so that lives can be saved and people healed. Especially, Lord, we ask that you would empower researchers at this time, particularly giving them knowledge and breakthroughs to get the much-needed vaccine developed. In your mercy, Lord, make us true to Christ. And we particularly lift before you the nations of East Africa, as they encounter damaging floods, swarms of locusts, and then the coronavirus, and with all the consequences of each of these. Father, may you restore a supply of food where there's hunger, shelter where all has been lost, and in time bring restoration of what the locusts have eaten. Specifically, we've been asked to pray for the Diocese of Kajiado in Kenya and for Bishop Gadiel, the clergy and lay leadership and all the people of the diocese responding to the major challenges. And also for the Diocese of Luero, for Bishop Eridard in Uganda, Choco Hospital and the wider needs of the diocese in this time of lockdown and hunger. Lord, we ask that you would provide. Lord, we ask that you would sustain. And Lord, in the midst of a dark time, we ask that you would bless these leaders and these people. In your mercy, Lord, make us true to Christ. And in our diocesan cycle of prayer, we uh, pray this week for the, uh, the, the parish of Drumara and Garvahi and their rector, Colin Taylor. And we've been asked to thank God for the opportunities that this time has, has presented for parishioners to offer support to others in the church and the wider community. Uh, Father, we thank you for the work of the Sunday School and ask that you would bless, even in this time, Lord, uh, the children and their growth, uh, developing to know you more. And Lord, we lift before you the services each Sunday, the Bible study each week and thoughts for the day going on even even at this time of lockdown, uh, Lord, that you would bless the work of that and even grow the parish through this difficult time. And Father, also we pray particularly for Bishop David. Lord, we thank you for appointing him to be our Bishop, Lord, for this difficult time. Father, we thank you for his leadership and wisdom. But Lord, we ask you would continue to keep him and the family safe and healthy and strong and that you would continue to inspire and empower him by your spirit, Lord, for all that is needed now and for the future. Lord, may our diocese continue and even more grow to be a beacon of your truth and hope in this place. In your mercy, Lord, make us true to Christ. And to conclude, let us say together, Eternal God, in whom is all our hope in life, in death, and to all eternity. Grant that rejoicing in the eternal life which is ours in Christ, we may face whatever the future holds, calm and unafraid, always confident that neither death nor life can part us from your love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together, the family prayer that holds us together as God's people, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And let's join in our closing prayer. God of our salvation, you have restored us to life. You have brought us back again into your love by the triumphant death and resurrection of your Son. Continue to heal us as we go to live 
and work in the power of your Spirit to your praise and glory. Amen. May Christ, who out of defeat brings new hope and a new future, fill you with his new life and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen.